on FYI. Are the devastating floods and droughts across the world down to climate change? And why are more of us becoming vegan? And is it better for the planet? I became vegan because I knew the impact it has on the animals as well as the impact on the environment. This is FYI, your weekly news show where we bring you the latest on the big stories in the UK and around the world. Yeah, and we've got loads of info for you this week. But first, we love nothing more than to investigate possible fake news and put your fake news detection skills to the test. So let's see what you think. Now this is a pretty out of this world story. Apparently an eight year old girl managed to radio call the International Space Station from her own home and actually speak to an astronaut. But is this recording real? Mike Zero, Lima Mike Hilo. My name is Isabella. I'm eight years old. This is NA1SS. Welcome to the International Space Station. Or how about this photo being shared online of a peninsula, which is known as Bear Mountain, because it looks like a bear? But does it really look like that, or is it just photo editing? Fake news or fact, we'll let you know later. So Scarlett, have you been seeing these devastating floods that have been hit in Pakistan? And apparently a third of the country is covered by water and sadly many people have died. That's so awful. I know it is, and this is all down to heavy rainfall during what's known as their monsoon season, which obviously means, as you can see, it rains all the time. But well, this happens every year in Pakistan, but they're saying this could be the worst that they've ever seen. Rivers have been bursting their banks, and countries like the UK and others have been supplying aid and support, but they still think that more is needed. So from floods to droughts, I mean, most of Europe and even some parts of the UK, as we've seen, have been experiencing a drought from all these heat waves we've been getting and the very little rainfall. And apparently it's the worst drought in over 500 years. And experts are even warning that this could affect the amount of food we get from crops this year. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? And check this out in China. So they've been experiencing their hottest and dry summer on record. So they've been sending up rockets and drones up into the clouds to try and bring on rain. How does that work? I know it sounds made up, doesn't it? So it's a process called cloud seeding. Basically, the aircraft sprays a special chemical into the clouds, which makes the water droplets in the clouds cluster together and increases the chances of rain. Experts are warning us that heat waves and floods will be more common if we don't stop polluting our atmosphere with gases that lead to climate change. So we know that loads of you really care about stopping climate change, and we'd love to hear about how you're doing your bit to help. Yeah, we heard from FYI News Club member Liberty, who wanted to tell us all about why she chooses to be vegan and why that helps the planet. She also got her friend Pippa involved. Over to you, Liberty. Hey, I'm Liberty, I'm 11 years old, and I'm a vegan. That means I don't eat meat, fish, eggs, or any dairy products. Hi, I'm Pippa, and I'm an omnivore, which means I can eat fish, meat, vegetables, and animal products. Today I'm here with my friend Pippa at the Just Me Show. I wanted to show Pippa why I choose to be vegan, and this show has loads of vegan food on offer. Let's go check it out. I'm really looking forward to see the chocolate stands, the marshmallow stands, and the vegan meat substitutes and cheese substitutes. I've not really tried much vegan food before, so this is going to be something new for me. Everyone else in my family also eats meat, which kind of means that if I didn't eat meat, I would have to have separate meals. If I were to go vegan, I'd probably miss eggs because it's part of everyday life, like eating cakes and things like that. People think that going vegan means less choice, but that's not true. You can make practically anything. So good. One of the things I love is pasta bolognese. And that's got beef in it, which is obviously meat. The good news, Pippa, is that there's even vegan spaghetti bolognese. You just replace the beef with lentils or a meat substitute and lots of vegetables. Broccoli? But quite crispy broccoli. Uh-huh. That is tasty. 
because I can't stand the texture of broccoli. I became vegan when I was like eight, and then before that I was on and off vegetarian because I knew the impact it has on the animals as well as the impact on the environment. I've heard that the global meat industry accounts for over 14.5% of global greenhouse emissions. The majority of the stuff is really tasty, and Pippa definitely likes some of the stuff too. So you've even got spreadable cheese. Oh yeah. We must try some. The cheese was not very nice. It was mm, just no, I don't I didn't really like it very much at all. I thought there's no way this is gonna be making me vegan or any or veggie or anything like that. Um, I went in, I tried some of the food and I actually thought, wow, this is actually way nicer than what I normally eat. Thanks, Liberty and Pippa. So Scarlett, what do you reckon? Would you go vegan? I think there are loads of positives to it, but for me, I think I'd miss eating meat too much. And if there's something you'd like to report on on FYI, then the best way is to join the FYI News Club. We love it when you get in touch with us, so check out the details on our webpage, first.news/fyi, and you could be on screen before you know it. So as a lot of us head back to school, you might be wondering whether coronavirus will affect us this term or whether it's all behind us. Well, some scientists are worried that us thinking COVID's over means we won't be getting vaccinated or get the booster vaccine this autumn. And they think that getting vaccinated is the best way we'll manage COVID going forward. But how do vaccines work? Don't get it? mai has been investigating. <laughs> coronavirus. It's a thousand times smaller than the width of an eyelash, but this tiny bug has caused a giant problem. Millions of people have died from it, and many more have had to be treated in hospital. Even though most children don't get seriously ill from it, there's no doubt it's had an impact on all of us. It was originally noticed in the Chinese city of Wuhan, but after just a few months, it spread all over the world becoming a pandemic. Now though, thanks to some brilliant scientists, we're fighting back. As we all know by now, they've come up with a special kind of medicine called a vaccine, which helps us to protect ourselves. But to understand more about how vaccines work, we're gonna need to use our time machine. And we're heading back nearly 700 years. The year is 1348, we're in London, and the city is going through the worst pandemic in history. They call it the bubonic plague, or the Black Death, and the smell, <coughs> awful. The disease was spread by fleas carried on the fur of rats. Ugh. And like many pandemics, it kept on coming back over the centuries, including the Great Plague of London in 1665. Another terrible disease that killed millions of people over many centuries was smallpox. And that's where vaccines have been an incredible success story. Back in 1980, the World Health Organization declared that smallpox had been completely wiped out. It was all thanks to a vaccine developed by a brilliant British scientist called Edward Jenner. With the help of a cow called Blossom, Jenner took a small sample of a less serious disease called cowpox and injected it into an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps. It gave James a mild illness, but it also helped his body to create substances called antibodies in his blood to fight off the cowpox. The clever thing is that these antibodies also protected James from catching the similar but more deadly smallpox disease. The vaccines that have been developed for COVID work in a similar way, helping our bodies to recognize coronavirus infections and fight them off but some people have refused to get vaccinated because they're concerned about whether or not they're safe. To find out more, I'm joined by Dr. Ellie Cannon from the NHS. Hi, Dr. Ellie. Hi there. So how effective are COVID vaccinations in fighting the pandemic? Well, thankfully, we can see that they are really effective. People who are vaccinated are much less likely to get severely ill or to end up in hospital. So we know that they are incredibly effective. I know some people have been worried about the safety of the vaccine and the potential side effects. Are they right to be concerned? 
Thankfully, with the COVID vaccines, once we started giving them to millions of people globally, we could see that the side effects were actually minimal. So people might have a sore arm or they might have a temperature for 24 hours. But in fact, there were very few side effects. And given the huge benefits for around the world, I think most people would agree that those small side effects were worth it. So will the vaccine help us to get rid of coronavirus altogether, like we did with smallpox? Smallpox is quite a different type of disease in the way it's transmitted and in how infectious it is. In fact, COVID-19 is something called a coronavirus, which you'll all know, and we've had coronaviruses around for a long time. This was just a new one, and we're used to them. They cause coughs and colds and sore throats. And what I think will happen eventually is COVID-19 will be just one of those viruses that we deal with every winter and we really don't think too much about it. Thank you for your time, Dr. Ellie. Thank you. So, it sounds like coronavirus is gonna be with us for some time to come. But with the help of the vaccine, the hope is that we could soon be returning to our normal lives. For more I Don't Get It explainers with info on loads of different topics, head to Sky Kids On Demand or our webpage, first.news slash FYI. Okay, Braden, I've got a question for you. Have you ever wanted to time travel and see what the streets in your hometown looked like years ago? I mean, it's not something I've really thought about, but I suppose that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I got to do just that. An event called Story Trails has been touring the country and it's all about discovering your city's old stories with the help of some virtual reality. I went to check it out. Move over, Doctor Who. I've come to Lincoln to travel through time and space, and I don't have a TARDIS. All I need is this and this. This journey through time and space is called Story Trails, and it's happening in 15 cities across the UK. The idea is to use the latest tech and archive footage to learn about the history of your city. In Lincoln, for example, the Augmented Reality, or AR Trail, invites visitors to meet the city's famous imp, who legend has it was turned to stone by an angel. The AR Trail uses an app to tell you about the history of Lincoln. It overlays an imp over real life to tell you a story. The AR basically takes you back in time and you can see what the city once looked like and interact with characters from history. Thanks for that. I thought I'd be stuck up there forever. What was your favourite part of the day? You're in that world. You're in a completely different place. And I feel like sometimes it's way more fun than the actual world. I think this is a really good way to learn history. I really, really liked it. I think it's not like the history at school is not good. It's like, I think it's just more fun. There's even VR headsets to see how life was different back in the day. I'm about to go back in time using these VR headsets and be in a 13-year-old girl's living room. It looks very different than a living room nowadays. There's a TV playing and the TV looks very old. There's a picture of the Queen and then a little tiny clock. There's a carpet, oh, a guitar. I'm playing the guitar. I can hear the guitar. This is really cool. It's just like a whole new way to learn and you, you feel like you're learning because you're learning loads of new information, but then at the same time, it's fun. And I think this type of learning in lots of people, like it stays in their brain better and they remember it for longer. Although the tour may already have left town, you can still experience story trails in the town libraries, as well as the AR experience on your phone. I think it makes you remember how quickly life passes by. And who knows? One day in the future, someone may be looking at us through a new piece of technology. So, did you guess this week's fake news or fact? The peninsula known as Bear Mountain isn't shaped like a bear quite so much. This photo is edited, so it's fake news. Here's the original photo of what Bear Mountain actually looks like. Which means this recording of eight-year-old Isabella speaking to an astronaut on the International Space Station is fact. Mike Zero, Lima, Mike Kilo. Mike Zero, Lima, Mike Kilo. This is NA1SS. Welcome to the International Space Station. My name is Isabella. I'm eight years old. Isabella, it's uh, so great to chat with you. Thank you for getting on the radio and saying hello. Thank you, Fly, fly Safe. 
Using her dad's radio equipment, Isabella managed to radio call the International Space Station and she spoke to the American astronaut, Chell Lindgren. He posted online that he loves speaking to radio operators all over the world, but his chat with Isabella was his favorite so far. Nice one, Isabella. Now that's about it from us, but we're gonna leave you with a story that's a little bit closer to her. We wanna say a big congratulations to Mac Rutherford, who at 17 years old has become the youngest person to ever fly around the world solo. He is following in the footsteps of his older sister, Zara, who earlier this year became the youngest woman to fly around the world solo. Pretty impressive family. Here's more from Mac's five-month journey around the world. See you next time.